In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. The king will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The king will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. The authorities are God's servants for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. The king will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. The king will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Imagine that someone came up to you with a box. They said, I need you to do something for me. I need you to hold this box. Actually, I need you to hold this box for the next four years. And if you set it down, or if you drop it, or if you jostle it the wrong way, the entire world will end. Any brave souls interested in holding the box? No, that's weird. What if I told you you would get lots of accolades and respect from people around you if you held the box? What if I told you that after four years you could get rich having been one of the few people who got to hold the box? What if I told you that holding the box gave you immense, immense power and nearly everyone in your life would do exactly what you wanted while you were holding the box? Any takers? Anybody want to hold the box for the next four years? No? Huh. If someone had said yes, if someone had said that they wanted to hold this box for the next four years, knowing that if they set it down or dropped it, the world would end, if someone had said yes, how many of us would have thought there was something not quite right with that person? Yeah? Most of us. So isn't it strange then, knowing what we know, that holding this box is not a really wise proposition. Most people should say no to it. Most reasonable, sane, thinking people should say no to it. Isn't it strange how every four years we decide as a society that the most important thing we're gonna do for a few months is fight over who gets to hold the box? Like clockwork, every four years, a couple people stand up and say, I can hold that box. And some people say, yeah, they can hold that box. And other people say, oh, no, if they hold that box, bad, bad things are going to happen. They need to hold the box. Every four years, like clockwork, we get together and fight over who holds the box. And obviously, the box that we're talking about is the presidency. 
And we're not just talking about the presidency, we're talking about American governance in general, but we place an awful lot of emphasis on who gets to be president. John Dickerson, a political reporter, recently wrote a book about the presidency, and he describes America as a president-obsessed nation. We put an awful lot of stock in who gets to hold the box. And there's an awful lot of weight that we put on or in the box. There's the obvious things, of course, things like international trade agreements and marginal tax rates. They seem like they definitely belong in the box. The nuclear codes go in the box. They actually go in a box not that different from this, but I think it's metal. And it follows the president around 24-7. The president is never more than a few feet away from a box that holds the codes that can actually end the world. The nuclear codes go in the box. But we aren't content as a society to leave it just at international trade agreements and marginal tax rates and the nuclear codes. We keep heaping more and more and more and more and more onto this box. What options should a woman have who's facing an unintended pregnancy? Oh, we'll put that on the box. How should we relate with people who are of a different race or ethnicity than we are? Let's put that on the box. Who should get to worship in what ways? Oh, that can go on the box, too. What does it mean to be a good person or to be a good citizen? Let's load that on the box. Who gets to express their humanity and their citizenship in the public square? We'll load that on the box, too. More and more and more we heap onto this, and then we fight over who gets to hold it. I'm in my mid-30s, so this is the 10th presidential election cycle that I've lived through. I don't remember the first few. But every one that I can remember, I have been told, is the most important election of my lifetime. Which, statistically speaking, is impossible. One of them may have been, this one might be, in fact, but they can't all be. But because of how much we have loaded onto this box and all of the decisions and all of the weight and all of our understandings about what it means to be a good person, we fight over who gets to hold this box. And more and more, you're seeing people who claim to have put their faith in Jesus start to believe that there is an awful lot riding on who holds the box. In fact, there's a guy going around right now who has said, and this is a direct quote, if I don't get to hold the box, if I don't get to keep holding the box, quote, it will hurt God. And in one occasion, he actually said, if I don't get to keep holding this box, quote, there will be no God. And just to be clear, theologically speaking, that is an absurd statement. God is the pre-existent source and foundation of all things. If God does not exist, the box does not exist. Just so we're clear on that point. But we put all of this weight on the box, and then this decision feels so incredibly heavy. heavy. Every day I drive by a yard sign that somebody has out, and it starts with the words, you can only choose one, and then it has two check boxes. And the one is the name of a presidential candidate, and the other is America. You only get to choose one. Vote for this candidate or vote for America. I heard someone else, a former speaker of the House of Representatives, someone who presents himself as a serious politician and a serious thinker who has said, if my preferred candidate doesn't get to hold the box, he said, quote, it will be the end of civilization. These are the stakes we seem to think we're arguing about because we have put so much weight and responsibility on the box. Now, some of us, as followers of Jesus, we want to do the right and noble thing. So we come to Scripture looking for answers. Maybe Scripture can tell us which of these people ought to actually hold the box. If we read Scripture carefully enough and closely enough, it will make it clear to us who should hold the box. We come to Scripture with this question. Although I think if we're honest, a lot of us come with our minds already made up about who should hold the box, and then we just look for some justifications and rationalizations from Scripture. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe none of you struggle with that. 
But some of us genuinely, we do come with an open mind to Scripture saying, who is it that ought to hold the box? Trusting there ought to be an answer for this pressing, urgent question for us in Scripture. But Scripture has this sometimes infuriating tendency. Jesus, as the Word of God made flesh, had this same infuriating tendency. Scripture, much like Jesus, often refuses to answer the questions we put to it. If we come to Scripture with an open mind, asking who gets to hold the box, who ought I support in their desire to hold the box, if we come to Scripture with an open mind, what we may discover is that Scripture, or we might be bold, so bold as to say God through Scripture challenges us, ask a better question. Ask a better question. Perhaps the question that Scripture seeks to answer, the question that Scripture seeks for us to ask is not who should hold the box, but is it appropriate for this box, with all of its weightiness and responsibility, and this apocalyptic sense that if someone mishandles it, the world will end, is it appropriate that this box exists at all? I believe that Scripture is unafraid to challenge some of our basic presuppositions about the way the world is and the way the world ought to be. Scripture has this capacity to stretch our imagination beyond what we actually already know is possible and challenges us to think in new ways. And so if we come to Scripture not saying, tell me who, to hold, who ought to hold the box, but if we come to Scripture saying, what, what should be the ways that we structure our shared life together? How should we do this? We might find some very, very fascinating answers to a much more intriguing and challenging question. And if you were to try to sum up in a single word what Scripture teaches about the role of human government, if you try to do it in one word, I believe this is the best word you could come up with. Scripture is ambivalent. Do you know this word, ambivalent? I didn't used to know this word. I heard someone use it once, and I didn't know what it meant. And instead of looking it up in the dictionary, I did that thing that we did, do where we just pick up some context clues and guess what it means. And based on how it was used in this sentence, I assumed that ambivalent meant indifferent. To say that I am amb ambivalent about something is to say I don't care. But that's not actually what the word ambivalence means. Ambivalence means having two energies, dual energies. Valence, it's a term that comes from ancient Greek, but we use it in chemistry to refer to how many different bonds a molecule can make. And so it's a way of speaking about energy or energetic potential. And ambi, we use this in words like ambidextrous. It means both, both. So scripture has two of these different energies, strong energies coursing through it. When you come to scripture saying, how ought we structure our shared lives together as humans, and what role do human governments play in how we structure our lives together? Scripture has two energies. One we might say is scripture has big government energy. Scripture has a big government energy. Coursing through Scripture is this idea that human governments matter significantly. Human governments are tremendously important. And the people who sit in positions of power matter. The Old Testament is fixated on who is king and what do they do with their kingly reign. The Old Testament suggests that a single king, by virtue of paying attention to the commands of God, can change the entire course of a nation. Scripture is very concerned about government. It has this big government energy saying, pay attention, it matters. The folks who hold this box, it matters deeply. God is invested in it because it pertains to the flourishing and well-being of society. And this big government energy, it's not just contained to the Old Testament. I mean, think about what we read in Romans 13, that those authorities that exist have been instituted by God that the authorities are God's servant for our good, and the authorities are also God's servant to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. This is big government energy, saying that government is not only good, it is godly. But if this were the only thing that Scripture said about government, this is essentially what it might, how it might work. Hey, Ron, you're not going to slaughter that pig here, are you? Not to worry. I have a permit. 
This just says I can do what I want. I am the director of the parks department, and this is a park. If the only thing scripture said about government was Romans 13, Romans 13 would essentially be a permit to anyone who occupies a position of power that says, I can do what I want. There is no check, there is no balance, there is no external control, there is no external standard. The authorities that exist are established by God. And so I have heard people of faith who rise to prominence in governmental positions and are exercising power and choose to exercise that power in flagrantly immoral ways, when they're called on it, say, well, Romans 13 says that the authorities have been instituted by God. So the actions that we've taken are God's will. Can you believe that? If this were the only scripture pertaining to government that existed in all of the Bible, that would be our only rational response. Whoever is in charge is in charge, and whatever they do is God's will. So the colonists would have had no grounds for rebelling against the tyrant King George because he was established by God. And we would have no need to participate in a democratic process because whoever is elected is established by God. If this were the only scripture that spoke to questions of governance, it would amount to a permit that says the government can do what it wants. But Scripture does not only have this one energy, this one big government energy. Scripture has another energy coursing through it in both the Old and New Testaments, a powerful energy that in some ways serves as a counterbalance to this big government energy. Scripture has big anarchist energy. Let me just define this word anarchist for us quick, because I know we have this working definition, sort of how I had the wrong understanding of ambivalence. A lot of us hear anarchy, and we assume it's a synonym for chaos. Just to be clear, Scripture is not pro-chaos. That is not Scripture's intention or desire. Anarchy is not a synonym for chaos. It comes from a Greek word, arche, which means beginning, but also means ruler or authority. The arche is the ruler. And an simply means against, anarchy, against authority. And Scripture has this energy coursing through it that is against authority. Think about what we read in 1 Samuel 8. The children of Israel are tired because they've lived under a, a series, a succession of ineffective and weak rulers. They've been facing constant threat from outside, and every now and then God would raise up a judge who would beat back the threat from outside, but then the judge would die, and then they would have no ruler. And it felt like chaos. So they go to their then ruler, the prophet Samuel, and they say, give us a king to govern us, just like other nations. Give us an RK. This is pro RK. And Samuel is disturbed by this request, and so he goes to God and goes, the people that you've appointed me over are requesting a king, what should I do? And God's response to Samuel is, tell them what's going to happen. And so Samuel runs through this list of all the ways the government that they desire will malfunction. It will tax them, it will conscript them for armies, it will raise a standing army, it will take their daughters, it will take their sons, the king will take and take and take and take and take. This is what the king will do. And God promises that they will get so sick and tired of this king and the ways that he rules them that they will come to God and cry out saying, help us. And God will say, sorry, I can't, it's your own dumb fault. 1 Samuel 8 is an anarchist text. It is a text against the idea of centralized, consolidated governmental authority. It is a text against the king. And although many of the biblical writers, the Old Testament writers, become very concerned about the king and all of the complexity and palace intrigue, and we have whole books of the Bible dedicated to it, this big anarchist energy courses throughout the Old Testament in the tradition of the prophets. Prophets say the kings are leading us astray. The kings have done wrong. The kings are not doing what is right in God's sight. Think about a story like David and Bathsheba and how that works its way into the biblical text. This is not a text that paints the king in a flattering light. And this is the greatest king Israel has ever known and ever seen. If we had a story like that about George Washington, we would not teach it in our schools. We just wouldn't. 
But this text works its way in because there's always this strong critique. Yes, there's this big government energy. The king matters, and who is king matters, and what the king does matters. And there's this other energy that says, we should not have this sort of centralized, powerful person ruling and reigning over us. We should have no king but God. And both of these energies run through the Old Testament. And they continue in the New Testament. Paul, the same Paul who said there is no authority except that which God has established, also says that there may be, and this is dripping in sarcasm, there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth. In fact, there are many gods and lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. This is big anarchist energy. There are these people who claim to be ruling and reigning, the so-called gods and lords, and these are not religious titles for Paul. These are political titles. Caesar would have called himself Lord, and Paul says they don't really exist or at least they don't exist in the way that they claim to in terms of having the type of power that they claim to have. It's not real. It's a fiction because there is one God and one Lord. Elsewhere in the book of Ephesians, we read that we struggle not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the archaes. Our struggle, Ephesians says, as Christians is to struggle, wrestle with, wrestle against the rulers and authorities against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So this is saying there's a, a political reality and there's a spiritual reality behind that political reality. And as Christians, we aren't wrestling against the people sitting in this political reality, but we are wrestling against the rulers and authorities. We don't think anyone should hold this box. So both of these energies course through Scripture. So the question for us, as followers of Jesus, as people who want to live lives of faithfulness to Scripture, what should our posture be? I believe that our posture, just like Scripture's posture, should be ambivalent. We should have both of these energies coursing through us. We should accept and acknowledge, yes, governments exist, they are powerful, they matter, and if we are invited to participate, perhaps we have a certain obligation to do so, and we should have this energy that questions the entire enterprise, the entire endeavor. Now, I'm not suggest suggesting that this is easy or comfortable. It would be far more comfortable to just pick a lane and stay in it to say we are going to be those people who believe that government matters deeply and so we're going to throw ourselves into it and invest ourselves in it and trust that we can bring about justice and righteousness through the function of government. We're just going to stay in that lane and run full speed ahead. Then I have friends who are in that space. Or it would be easy to say the entire enterprise is corrupt and morally bankrupt. Anyone who wants to hold this box, something is wrong in their head, and so I want nothing to do with it. I'm going to stay as far away from, I can, uh, from it as I can, and all I'm going to do is critique it. I have friends who run in that lane. But Scripture challenges us with both of these energies. And so it could be that if we come to Scripture with the question, who ought to hold the box this time, Scripture may respond by challenging us, should the box exist in the way that it does? And Scripture might challenge us with these dual energies, a big government energy that cares deeply about who's in charge and the consequences and implications of their exercise of authority, and a big anarchist energy that says there's only one Lord whose name is Jesus Christ, and my only allegiance and only participation is in his kingdom. Scripture challenges us with both of those energies. And I would say that by and large, as a society, in the second half of October, in a year that is a multiple of four, we have an awful lot of big government energy right now. This almost apocalyptic sense that if the wrong person holds the box, the world will end. And some of us buy into this sort of thinking, maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously. 
We feel our anxiety rising. We feel our fear and worry rising. We're stressed out. What is the right decision? What is a biblically faithful decision? We feel this big government energy. And so it could be that Scripture needs to give us a little jolt, a little reminder. God never desired or intended for the children of Israel to have a king. It was a concession to their own flawed desires. The New Testament is unequivocal that Jesus is, in fact, Lord, which involves an implicit demotion of anyone else who would aspire to a position of authority, whether they call themselves Caesar or call themselves Kaiser or call themselves a king or call themselves a president. All of them are demoted in the New Testament's understanding. So those of us who are coursing with that big government energy need this jolt from Scripture to remind us there are other things that are more significant and more important. But there are also those of us who have heard that call of Scripture, who have felt that energy to be skeptical and suspicious and questioning and rejecting the very idea of human governance. Folks who tend toward this big anarchist energy. I would put myself in this category. I'm deeply skeptical and suspicious, and I'm not convinced I will ever live through an actual most important election of my lifetime. But even for someone like me who feels that energy, Scripture has a word of correction to jolt me with this reminder that it does, in fact, matter who is in charge and how they exercise their authority. Because listen, it is easy to survey the entire enterprise, the entire endeavor of human government, and acknowledge that there is a moral abscess at the heart of it that sucks in that which is good and leeches out all that is evil. And so it would be really easy for me to just sit back and pop some popcorn and wait for the entire morally bankrupt endeavor to collapse in of its own weight. It would be easy. But here's what I believe is Scripture's challenge to someone like me. Well, it may be true that this moral abscess is at the heart of the way we've structured our government. The reality is that until it collapses on itself, which it may never do, until it does, it's actually benefiting me just fine. My taxes are low. I live in a safe neighborhood. I never have to worry about gender-based violence or being targeted for persecution because of the way I want to worship or the color of my skin. This system that I am all too happy to critique benefits me deeply. And so I'm not convinced that it's Christian or following the example of Christ to simply wash my hands of the matter and wait for it to fall apart. Netflix recently released a film focused on Sherlock Holmes' sister, Enola. It's a so-so movie. But it has this interesting scene where Sherlock, who's sort of a bit character in the movie, is in a conversation with someone, and they ask Sherlock about his politics. He says, oh, politics bores me. I'm like, yes, I'm here for this. And the woman talking to him says, well, of course it does. You have no interest in changing a system that benefits you so well. So for those of us who want to sit back wash our hands of the matter, wait for it to collapse, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing that from a position of comfort and ease and privilege? Or are we doing it from a posture of self-sacrificial love for those for whom the system is not working well and actually poses a tremendous danger to their well-being? It's not enough to simply step back and say, well, I don't think the box exists. Well, the weight of the box is crushing sisters and brothers made in the likeness and image of God. It is not Christian to do that. We need both of these energies, an energy that says it matters who is in charge and it matters how they govern, and an energy that says only Jesus is Lord and only Jesus' kingdom is that which really matters. We need both of these energies. And I'm not convinced this will put you in a position of comfort and ease over the next few weeks, but I'm also not convinced that God's primary interest is in our comfort. God is for our well-being and the well-being of all those around us. And if that well-being entails some discomfort, then I believe that God will be faithful through that time and period of discomfort. So who should hold the box? 
Should we have a say in who holds this box? Maybe. We're going to keep talking about it over the next couple of weeks. I don't know all the answers, but one question I have is what are the things that you and I can do tangibly today to reduce the import and significance of this box? It is true that none of us will get the nuclear codes. We're not going to get to take that out of the box. But by the ways we practice hospitality and welcome to strangers, we diminish their importance. It is true that none of us will get a single unilateral vote over the abortion policies of this nation. But by the ways we talk and speak about and think about our own sexual expressions, and by the ways we care for those who are experiencing unintended, unwanted pregnancies, we might make the weight of that question a little bit less important. And I'm not here to tell you that just personal kindness can undo the legacy of 400 years of systemic entrenched racism in this country. I don't believe that it can, but that doesn't mean it's not our obligation to love and welcome all those whom God places into our lives to root out and recognize the racist ideals that exist within ourselves and to allow the transforming grace of God to excise those from our lives, we can reduce the weight and importance of what is in this box. So I want to leave you with a question. What are the things that you have decided to offload and outsource? Are there obligations or expectations that Christ has given to you that are entirely appropriate and entirely yours to carry with the grace and help of God that you have attempted to outsource. To say, let's just put it in the box. As long as I fight for the right person to hold the box, then I've done my part. Are there ways that we have made this box weightier and more burdensome than God desires for it to be? And if there are, what are our responsibilities, our actions to remove some of that weight and take it back upon ourselves. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for your faithfulness. That when the children of Israel chose a human king instead of you, you stayed in faithful covenant relationship with them, seeking to redeem and restore that which had been lost. And we give you thanks that in spite of all of our arrogant attempts to play the role of God by setting up our governments and giving them ultimate power, you remain faithful to us. The example of Jesus coming as a servant, not seeking to lord it over anyone, not seeking to be served but to serve, that example shows us your way. So we ask and we pray, God, that each of us would follow faithfully in the example of Jesus by the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the precious name of Christ. Amen.